Hello, virtual EA Global. Uh, thanks to all of you who've uh, come to this virtual conference, um, even though the in-person uh, event got cancelled. And thank you also to Amy and to the rest of the team for putting in all the hard work um, on this conference. And then even more, being willing to overcome the deep sunk costs you faced and made the right call to cancel the conference early, giving people enough time to make other plans. So this situation sucks. I'm not sure if Amy and others really wanted me to talk about coronavirus, but I'm going to do so anyway. Uh, given the circumstances, I would find it hard to talk about anything else. But in particular, I wanted to just offer a couple of reflections that I've had over this time. And there are reflections on the basis of a fact that I regard as quite striking, which is just how ahead of the curve the effects of altruism community was when it comes to, came to the risk that coronavirus presented. Even back in mid-January, my entire Facebook feed was filled with discussions of the coronavirus. And that wasn't merely because Rob Wiblin alone accounts for half of my Facebook feed, so that was a significant part of it. Um, I actually got Rob to look at a draft of this talk earlier today, and the first thing he did on creating, on uh, reading this section, was create another Facebook post, which you can see. And now I'm normally the one in this community pushing back on what I regard as kind of too high estimates of certain risks of catastrophe. But in this case, I just think it's absolutely clear that this early concern was utterly vindicated. And there are three things I've taken away from this. The first takeaway is just feeling more viscerally that careful reasoning really does give us the ability to identify important but neglected problems in the world. Along with other allies, we've been saying for many years that we're not sufficiently prepared for the next big pandemic. The current crisis was preventable if only if society had invested in better preparedness measures earlier on. The second takeaway is on the importance of just some basic concepts of scientific reasoning. I think there were really just two concepts that made the difference about why there was so much, much earlier concern among the EA community. And those two concepts were firstly, the idea of exponentials, really appreciating how bad things can get and how quickly they can get very bad. And secondly, the idea of expected value theory, that in many circumstances, you should be preparing for worst case scenarios rather than hoping that things will you know, turn out all right. These aren't hard concepts to understand, but they're not common in the world today. The third takeaway I had was about the power of social conformism, and for that reason, the importance of selective weirdness. Early on, on both traditional and social media, there was so much of a push against panicking. Even though that's exactly what you want to do as a society, when a new virus arises, you absolutely should freak out when there are only a dozen cases. If you do so, you stop the spread, you manage to contain it. Even though you might then subsequently look like a crazy person because you freaked out about this thing that, in the end, because of your actions, only killed a few people. I remember there was a period when everyone was saying, oh, you shouldn't panic because the virus it only kills the elderly and vulnerable. What the fuck? Those are my parents you're talking about. The only way I could reconcile the prevalence of that argument, which thankfully has largely disappeared now, is that with the psychological explanation that people, they just didn't want to confront the reality of what was going on, that would have involved taking major actions that was, you know, socially weird, and so via a process of cognitive dissonance just had to reach for 
any sort of explanation that means they could continue with status quo, behavior as usual. In a closing talk I gave a few years ago, um, the message I pushed was, keep EA weird. Well, this is where the payoff is. Being, be being willing to be weird sometimes means that in unusual circumstances you can take unusual action. And that can often have enormous positive effects. So next time someone asks, well, if, if AI is so important, why isn't everyone already freaking out about it? Well, I mean, you shouldn't dismiss that argument out of hand. It's not a terrible argument. But we do just know that sometimes people will fail to freak out even in those circumstances where they really should. So I do just think that some core concepts that we value and promote have been vindicated in this situation. At the same time, I wish we could have been able to do more. If we'd had more time to invest in the technology and policy that can enable rapid vaccine and antiretroviral deployment, then perhaps we would have been able to reduce the time period for which we have to employ such draconian measures of suppression. If we had better modeling ability, more transparent models, and more groups working in parallel, we would have moved to suppression sooner, saving many lives. If we'd have had more influence in China, such that there was a greater appreciation of the seriousness of pandemics, more of a preparedness plan, and more of a willingness from government officials to be weird, well, perhaps we could have contained the disease right at the very beginning. Perhaps we would be thinking this was no worse than the SARS outbreak. So the coming months are going to be strange ones. And we've lost the main opportunity we have each year for the EA community to get together and catch up and learn from each other. But that doesn't mean we have to close off all contact with each other altogether. Amy has set up things to make it easy to hold virtual meetings over the course of this conference. And that does not need to end now. You absolutely can and should continue to connect with other participants in this conference and other members of the EA community for the months to come. I mean, people are going to be pretty bored, pretty lonely. They won't find it a burden to have someone reach out and ask to chat. They'll probably think of it as a nice opportunity to make a new connection or rekindle an old one. Um, in the early days of EA, in fact, half of what we did was via Skype. I became close friends with Nick Beckstead and frenemies, now friends, with Holden Karnowski well before I met either of them in person. Okay. Motivational speeches sometimes mention the idea that the Chinese word for crisis is formed of two characters, one that refers to danger and one that refers to opportunity. Now, unsurprisingly, that uh, little idea is not true, but the sentiment underlying it, I think, is accurate. If you look at major positive changes that have happened in the world in the past, like the formation of the United Nations after the Second World War, the swing to free market economic policies in the 1980s after stagflation, the Nunn-Lugar scheme to radically reduce nuclear proliferation after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, often they come at crisis points where we realize that the old ways of doing things just are no longer working. So what we should say once this crisis is over is never again. The current median estimate from Metaculus is that this virus, by the end of the year, will kill over 3 million people. The mean of this is obviously much higher. This could have been prevented. So we should use this crisis point as an opportunity to redouble our efforts and our energies towards making the world a better place towards trying to lessen the impact of those ongoing catastrophes that are still ongoing even though we live under this pandemic and now are in fact more neglected, and also to prepare for those 
catastrophic risks that we might face in the decades to come. Thank you.